like to jump in? Yes, um, thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity to, to give a, an update here. Uh, the team will be joining in as well. Um, I think it's worthwhile to just acknowledge kind of where we're at here in a, a place and time. It's been almost five weeks since we uh, declared a local emergency. Um, and it's uh, been over three weeks since the county issued the sh uh, shelter in place order um, that has now been extended till May 3rd. That's another four weeks for a, a total of seven weeks ultimately uh, if, if that stays. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, the many who have been working nonstop since the, the crisis has started. Um, and, you know, I have been taking this opportunity to to highlight some just amazing work. Um, and so I, I do want to do that today um, in recognizing uh, the city's IT department. Um, you know, while, while some employees are provided a city laptop, that the majority of our city employees uh, are not provided take home equipment. And um, uh, IT's business solutions team really had to expedite the purchasing process to secure hundreds of laptops and other equipment to, to allow employees to continue their work uh, remotely. Um, IT super uh, cybersecurity team it increased the city's VPN capabilities to handle thousands of new users virtually all at once um, while, while maintaining the security of all of our systems. Um, and then IT also supported departments in creating new specific SharePoint sites to make it easier for staff to share uh, documents virtually. Um, and IT also had to help departments install a lot of licensing and, and uh, new programs like Zoom and Skype to be able to do their work. So I just really want to take this moment to thank Rob Lloyd and the entire IT department for all of their work uh, especially that work leading up to the, the stay at home order and, and getting all of our uh, staff that are continuing to work remotely uh, in a position to be able to do that. So thank you very much to our IT department who continues to do a lot of that work as, as we kind of confront the challenges associated with, uh, with working remotely. Um, so I'm going to now ask the team to step up. Um, and, and provide an, an update on various subjects like we have been doing. So you're gonna hear from, from Lee Wilcox on a, an update on, on our roadmap. Um, you'll hear from uh, Kip Harkness, who'll provide an update from the EOC, and then some detailed updates, um, specifically on state and fun, uh, federal funding support from Jim Shannon and Ben Chang. Uh, an update, a detailed update on local assistance framework from Kim Wallace and Michelle McGurk and an update on our communications plan from uh, Rosario Nieves. So um, look forward to all of that. Um, I just wanna note that our update on our fiscal status will be done under 3.3. So we'll, we'll do that after this item. So uh, Lee, can you uh, take it from here? Thanks, Dave. Um, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Today is Tuesday, and that is the day in our Emergency Operations Center that we uh, rotate. So uh, this past week, Kip um, has been our EOC director, and, and him and the team have done an, an amazing job over the last week. And I'll let Kip speak to kind of the accomplishes, accomplishments from the past week. Um, last Wednesday, Kip and I presented the three challenges of now, um, our public health challenge, our economic challenge, as well as the fiscal challenge. Um, as we indicated last week, ensuring we don't solely focus on one of these, but um, ensuring that we optimize our response across all three is critically important. And how we operationalize this within our emergency operations center and, and throughout the organization is our roadmap. This is our ability to, as we mentioned last week, plan and act and plan and act. And as we spoke to you last week, the importance of this um, kind of long, longer term challenge that we face, operationalizing that is that it is important. So as you can see in number seven, um, including funding and cost recovery and, and all of the work that would normally take place after a crisis or a challenge or an event is, um, has occurred, we've built that into our emergency operations center. So as we continue to plan and operate, we're taking those considerations um, in a greater detail. 
um, you're going to hear some updates around the local assistance, um, our, our homelessness strategy, and a few others today, specifically around recovery, around local assistance, and how we're working with the federal and state government. You're going to hear updates and more information today. Um, part of the um, part of our task this week for for Kip and I and team is to really come forward next week with a broader strategy. Um, about how all of these things connect across those three challenges uh, and better inform you in your decision making as we bring forward um, specific items that you have that context. So we'll be bringing that into the EOC um, this week and as we get out of kind of the, the short term challenges that we've faced that we've needed to operationalize very quickly, we'll be able to get kind of our head above water and take um, a view of what needs to happen in the several weeks and months to come. With that, I'll hand it over to Kip and stop my sharing so he can share his slides. Kip? Thank you, Lee. Let me pull up my slide deck here and share it all with you as well. So as Lee, uh, Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, members of the public. As Lee mentioned, uh, spent the last week in the director seat of the Emergency Operations Center. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on uh, what we've been up to over the last seven days in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As Lee mentioned, we've been working from our roadmap, which gives us a kind of a 12 week snapshot of what's most important. Um, starting with the compliance with public health, supporting that with the essential services, and then focusing on at risk and making sure we have the people power to do that. So from the past seven days, just as a kind of a top level highlight, we, uh, our compliance branch and our APIO team have aired six radio public services announcement, announcements in English, Vietnamese, and Spanish on uh, various uh, radio stations and produce six social media influencer campaigns also in English, Vietnamese and Spanish as well as Mandarin. The essential services section ensured that all employees providing essential services have had the appropriate training, materials and supplies, especially for staff assisting in our food delivery and shelters. Our homeless support and services branch stood up Parkside Hall, South Hall and FEMA trailers at Kelly Park in our local assistance branch, we completed a work plan for analyzing existing city grants for nonprofit assistance. The safety branch established city workers compensation guidelines for COVID-19 claims and helped recommend an approach moving toward in-house testing. And then as of April 1st, the family support branch is now providing child care for all essential service workers who need it. And that's just a snapshot of some of the highlights of the last seven days of the team of now 300 people in the Emergency Operations Center supporting the larger 7,000 plus person organization. So uh, I wanna spend a little bit of time on a couple of key issues. One is compliance with the public health orders from the county. And the, as you can see, some public available data supp supplied by Google shows that uh, people are taking this seriously. We've seen significant decreases in retail, groceries, transit stations, workplace, residential, um, our parks data has been a little bit up and down and we're still keeping an eye on parks compliance to make sure that we can ensure that that is effective. And, and I know many of you have helped push the word out over the weekend that we need to ensure um, the social distancing at parks. But all in all, you can see that there's been a dramatic swing in our life from outside of the home to inside the home over the last uh, couple of weeks here. All of that appears to be effective. Uh, some data here comparing across California shows that e within the context of California, it appears that Santa Clara County is slowing in its growth relative to other places. And of course, relative to the rest of the nation, we appear to be successful at bending the curve. All of this is very early and preliminary, and so it's not the time to lit off the gas. Uh, it is the time to continue with what we're doing, but it does suggest that the actions of individuals and our community together is having a dramatic effect in saving lives and reducing suffering. So in terms of essential services, um, Dave mentioned some of the changes we've done, and I just wanted to shout out to all the workers who've continued to ensure that we have a supply of, of water where we supply water, garbage services across the city, wastewater and sewage uh, continue to flow uh, and, and are clean into the bay, uh, as well as sustaining police and fire operations with no reduction in service. 
um, and no major loss of service to our street lighting or uh, traffic control systems. So uh, I want to highlight one of the biggest new efforts that we've had uh, as a city, and that's in food necessities. And, and you can kind of think of this as the tip of the spear for the overall local assistance and the recovery work that we'll be supporting uh, in that second challenge of, of saving livelihoods as well as continuing to save lives. The way that the team has conceptualized it is that there are three basic things they're trying to do at once. One is to feed our most vulnerable. The people who need food, make sure that they have food. Second is to maximize our existing food network. So we're building on the strength and assets of Second Harvest Food Bank, the Health Trust, Meals on Wheels, all the good partners that we have on the ground now doing great work. And the third is to scale for a widespread food crisis um, so that we're ready for the worst if it comes. So just to, for some context, you know, the changes have been really dramatic. So back in uh, January 2020, which seems like a lifetime ago, we were talking about unemployment rates at historic lows of about 2.7%. Depending on which set of forecasts you want to look at, you're talking about unemployment going to potentially 20% next month ahead, uh, or uh, certainly well above 10 to 15%. That doesn't even count necessarily fully count gig workers and contract workers who aren't fully accounted for in the unemployment statistics. Mm -hmm. And it uh, doesn't count uh, the undocumented who are usually left out of those statistics entirely. Food insecurity is always an issue in this valley um, with the high costs. And even in the good times, one in four of our residents were at risk of food insecurity. We saw back in 2008 during the Great Recession that that was two in four, 50% of households were at risk for food insecurity. So we expect to see numbers like this again, or perhaps even worse as we move into the, the next phase of the uh, COVID response. So this gives you a sense of what the, the situation is and, the, and what we're dealing with. Just in terms of the city scaling up and what we've been stepping into, um, you know, prior to the COVID-19 crisis, the city itself was responsible for about 850 meals a day to, to seniors primarily. And so it represented by one green fork here as being 850 meals a day. If you look at what our efforts are uh, as of this week, uh, we and our partners are now uh, uh, accountable for over 325,000 meals a day. And that's obviously been a dramatic expansion for us, but every single one of the partners, Second Harvest being the largest and others, have seen a dramatic increase in the number of daily meals that they're providing and the number of daily meals that they are forecasting to provide. So this is a huge expansion for us as we've taken responsibility for this at the request of the county. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we spent a good deal of time just getting those meals out. And in this last week, we've had a little bit of a time to pause and reflect and prioritize the work over the coming 12 weeks. Um, it's a little bit geeky, but we did what's called weighted shortest job first, which allows us to take a look at five different work streams, 28 different possible priorities that emerges from, emerge from those five work streams, and look at each and every one item together in terms of what is the value it's producing for the community, what is the risk that it's mitigating or the opportunity that it's enabling, what is the time criticality, do I have to do this now or can I wait, and then what is the job duration and complexity to know what are the what are the uh, small items that might have a big effect. All told, you can see the green items are kind of our must do, some large scale important pieces that we have to get done. And then the orangish items right under those are good bang for the buck. Everything on this list needs to get done in order to meet our need, but this gives us a sense of what we do first and how we prioritize that work. All of this is in addition to the daily job of actually delivering the meals and getting the food to the seniors. This is the preparation work, the additional contracts, the coordination, the forecasting, the, the putting the mechanisms in place to be able to respond to and surge into the additional demands that we expect will happen as the effects of unemployment and the effects of the crisis kick in further. So how do you organize this work? The internal team has put together a very strong organizational chart. They've essentially stood up a new, uh, a new company, uh, uh, Food Match Co., uh, in a very short time. We've got uh, Neil Rufino and Dolan Becco leading that jointly. You've heard a lot from Angel, who's been the section coordinator above this. And now we've got a much clearer organizational structure that's thinking about everything from economic forecasting to coordination with schools, Second Harvest, city and partners around logistics and capacity building to the pure fulfillment of the operations 
to internal IT, business architecture, um, as well as communications and a whole range of logistics coordination. All of this is only possible because of the CBOs that are on the front ground, front, uh, front lines of this, and our partnership with Santa Clara County, um, and then some large providers such as Revolution Foods, World Central Kitchen, and others that are helping us out, as well as folks like Deloitte and Google providing expertise and assistance around how you organize and scale this. So all in all, uh, a, a new company, if you will, that has stood up within the last three weeks to support the existing CBOs and infrastructure in meeting the demand that we see. Um, so this is a, a little bit of the dashboard, just gives you a, a snapshot just from the last week. So current weekly meal totals were up over a, a million six hundred thousand. You can see that week over week, just in the last seven days, that that's an additional 13 percent for um, second harvest, 41 um, percent increase in our city county senior nutrition, 41 percent increase uh, approximately in meals on wheels. Uh, we don't have the exact number of increase from the school site, so that zero is, a, is, is actually non-data. And then um, our targeted homeless placements up 46%. And that's just from last week. That's not from, even from the beginning of the crisis. So we continue to scale uh, into this um, as this snapshot so shows. Um, this is a little bit of an eye chart, but it just shows you some of the work we've been doing with the schools to make sure that each district has the food supply that they need that they, um, uh, we can provide them um, uh, either a supply source if they don't have it, funding if they need it, or labor if, if they need that. And we've been working through the County Office of Education and the County EOC. The County EOC is the point of contact with schools for this emergency. They have a schools branch that they work with, and so we have coordinated our work through them and with them. And uh, we found that there's been a bit of a lag in terms of us getting out the information to all of the school districts. So we've been taking a proactive stance in the last uh, week or so to make sure that all the school districts understand the feeding, op feeding opportunities they have and the opportunities for reimbursement, as well as providing, as I said, labor, volunteer labor, uh, funding sources where necessary and, and back up to the school district. So again, uh, just a little bit of an eye chart here, but just to scope out the complexity of making sure this is all coordinated across the 30 school districts within the county um, has been a, a primary role that we've been playing as well. So uh, I'll go back and end with uh, our roadmap. There's a couple of things that have been brought, a number of good questions that have been brought up um, by the council member in, in ver both in conversations and, and various memos. I would point to item three here, uh, support for at-risk communities and populations. Now that we have done a very good job in assuring that the essential services are being provided and we have prepared and secured our workforce safely. Much of our attention is turning toward how we support our individuals, families, and businesses as they deal with economic hardships of this time. And so we have a number of branches, food necessity, homeless support, um, homeless prevention, as well as local assistance, some of whom you'll hear more about the local assistance shortly. And what we'll be doing over the next uh, five days or so is bringing those branches together in a, a task force into a tighter coordination so that they can begin to act very clearly in concert to support our most vulnerable uh, populations and communities. And that recovery task force will work in coordination with schools, um, helping them understand their options for feeding. We'll also be able to provide technical assistance to schools on childcare so that they can understand how to do what we've done in terms of standing up childcare. Uh, we'll also available through um, some of the funding that we provided through the digital assistance inclusion fund to provide technical assistance to some of the schools on distance learning. Um, but the bottom line is, is an, what we'll do is take in kind of all of the questions that were raised by council around things like childcare, feeding, distance learning, and we'll wrap that into the strategy that we roll out in terms of uh, our role in supporting our individuals families, small businesses, making it through this. We're going to continue to count on partners like the school district and the county to do their roles during this, but we will make sure that we are thinking thoughtfully about the needs of our community as we move forward with this recovery task force. One of the key roles that that task force is going to need to do is to stand up what we're referring to as sort of a virtual local assistance center. You know, we can't open the convention center and have 15,000 people come in and fill out forms, but there's there's a 
big need for people to fill out unemployment forms, to understand what their options are, to be connected with the different resources. And so how do we do that virtually, both by having a really good online presence that's easy to navigate, but also by having things like um, uh, a, a call-in location with people who are fluent in Spanish and uh, Vietnamese and Mandarin who can help our community through some of these processes. So that's part of what we'll be working on over the, the coming week is figuring out how to coordinate our ongoing efforts and how to stand up the equivalent of a virtual local assistance center. And I th think that's something um, that, that as we've talked uh, with the mayor's office and others about, we feel that there's a real potential role for council offices in this, um, because in particular, your staff have a lot of knowledge of the district and also tend to have a lot of uh, strong language skills. So we'll be, uh, as we figure out uh, exactly how we're gonna roll that out, we'll be reaching out to the mayor and council offices to support us in making sure that we are including the whole community in preparing them for the response. The, the last thing I would say is I, I think part of the reason that we've been successful so far is we have been extremely focused and we have focused just on the vital few things that are on this roadmap. There are many good and important things that we would like to do, but we can't do them all. So uh, I think as we look and evaluate these options, part of what we're gonna be doing is asking our partners to stand up and focusing on the role that we are best at and get, that can provide the most impact and support for our community in their time of need. So with that, I believe I'm turning it over to Kim to talk more in depth about some of our local assistance work. Kim? Actually, it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle McGurk, who in our liaison branch is leading the local assistance team. Okay, and I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, um, so as I uh, talked to the council a few weeks ago, it feels like uh, several months ago that I was here talking with you about our local assistance framework. Um, we have, um, you know, we have uh, the, um, do you have the screen in front of you? Michelle, I don't think we're, we're, we're not seeing the shared screen. Um, yeah, we're not. Let me, let me get that here and share it. There you go. There you go. Oh, we are. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so this slide will look very familiar to the council from a few weeks ago. We um, are really focusing on our residents, our small businesses, and our nonprofits, um, and really those who have been affected by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, whether it's a loss of business, um, at risk of displacement through loss of work hours or income, uh, venue closures and event closures to our nonprofits. Um, but I really want to tell you a very quick snapshot of the types of people that are being impacted and who've been helped already. Um, I have a few success stories from our partners at Sacred Heart and Destination Home. And in one case, um, I'll tell you about two moms and a dad um, who got help through the Silicon Valley Strong Funds. One of the moms is a server at IHOP. It's um, her, most of her income comes from tips and she's been supporting her children. Um, and basically all of her job opportunities um, disappeared with the closure of the restaurant. Um, Another case, a father only had $3 in his bank account and he was a graphic designer and wedding photographer and most of his business had dried up since February. And in another case, a new mom was just coming back from maternity leave to her job um, as a manager at a fitness gym where she made $17 an hour. And of course, um, that gym is no longer able to stay open. So all of these folks were able to get help with groceries and their bills through the, the Silicon Valley Strong funding that, um, that Sacred Heart had available. Um, as you all know, and you've heard, you know, there's a long waiting list for those funds. So I want to move to our um, next um, slide. We're really focusing next to ensure we can get access to an agreement, work with partners to get them signed up. And we will be reaching out to council 
with some opportunities for you to, um, to help us get the word out about the partners who can assist people with applying for not just unemployment, but disability, family leave, CalFresh, and other resources like that. Um, Kip talked about the access to food, and, the, and Lee touched on our access to housing that our operations branch are working on. And then I wanna stress that Silicon Valley Strong um, has raised a phenomenal amount of money for our residents, and that's really gap funding um, to help where the federal and state funds um, don't um, meet the needs of our residents. And um, there's a lot of different strategies that we um, are looking at and that you have been talking about that are helping our residents um, through this difficult time. Um, with our small businesses, we've been um, really working hard to get the word out. And there are, every day it seems that there's some new way that small businesses can get help. Um, sometimes the speed to deployment of, of resources um, creates its own challenges. Um, and we've seen that with some of the SBA programs where they've really worked to, to um, turn the switch on very quickly. And um, the Paycheck Protection Program, there's been quite a bit of press about how it launched, and yet it's been really, really challenging for small businesses to um, access either through their banks um, or other resources. But there are some great resources through emergency loans and the Paycheck Protection Program, um, as well as some state grant programs that are available and available to small businesses and nonprofits in a way that they've never been available before. We currently have 1.5 million in commitments to the Silicon Valley Strong Fund for small businesses, but I wanna be really realistic with the council that that's probably gonna help about 140 businesses. Um, we've got a fabulous partner um, in Opportunity Fund who will do the disbursement and Opportunity Fund is an expert in working with micro businesses, uh, minority and women owned businesses, uh, veteran owned businesses and immigrant owned businesses that have fewer than five employees. I mean, really, really small businesses and as well as sole proprietors. And so they're a perfect partner to um, help us with our most at risk businesses. There are a number of other grant and loan programs that are coming online through other partners and we're working very hard to um, collaborate with those partners and help get the word out. Um, we do have a hotline for small businesses, um, the 877-880-1222 number that's on the screen, as well as the COVID-19 SJ Business email address. And we have a great team with um, multiple language skills that's been able to answer um, those responses. Oops. So then for our nonprofits, um, and I'm going to be really honest um, with the council, the nonprofits um, are an area where we need your help. We need more fundraising to, um, to help our nonprofit sector. Um, that, you know, we're doing it, the first and most critical work that we're doing, which I believe Kip alluded to, is we've done a needs assessment out to our own city grantees. We are one of the largest grant makers in the Valley. And in the case of the arts and culture area, we are the largest grant maker. There is not a foundation out there that gives more money to the arts than the city of San Jose. So um, at least here locally in, in, in our city. So we, um, we are looking at a needs assessment. Where do we need to modify contracts that are, you know, where we've given a grant and life changed because of the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, we're also helping our nonprofits who've never really made access to SBA loans and the types of funds that are available through the CARES Act or state uh, resources and to really help them with technical assistance to get those um, funds. We've created an email address specifically for nonprofits, the COVID-19SJCBO, 
and have some of our most experienced uh, grants team members in the city working in the EOC to provide that um, system. For Silicon Valley Strong, we're partnering with the Community Foundation and the Knight Foundation to leverage our funding resources. Um, and we are looking for more resources to help our nonprofits. It's a tough time for all of them right now. So with that, um, that concludes uh, my report. And I think it goes on now to uh, Jim and Benna. Hi, folks. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, again, uh, Jim, Jim Shannon, the city's budget director. I'm going to turn this over to uh, Benna, who leads our intergovernmental relations group in just a second. But I just wanted to, to preamble that um, the work that's been going on at the federal and state level for um, uh, providing you know, relief to both broadly to the country and then to the state uh, was going to be really important to our, our city. As, as you know, there's, there's lots of different pieces of the legislation that are going to impact community members, businesses, and also the city municipality itself. Um, you know, uh, the, our ability to leverage the funding that's going to be provided for city response to COVID ac activities is going to be really critical as we look to sort of uh, figure out how we're going to be able to manage through the budgetary challenges over the next couple of years. Um, as Ben is going to talk, talk through, a lot of that is still, the details are still being worked out, unfortunately, so the timing is going to be tricky, but um, uh, ben and her team have been really on it and, and, and uh, proactive about making sure that the city's needs are rep representative, represented and then uh, making sure that the, the feedback that we're getting from the bills is being incorporated into how we're thinking about um, our emergency operations and our budgetary process. And so with that, I'm gonna let Benna take over. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, so again, my name is Benna Chang. I'm one of the co-leads for the intergovernmental relations team in the EOC. And uh, today I really wanted to give you all a quick overview of some of the state and federal funding actions that have taken place recently. I will say that this is a very dynamic space where the uh, uh, information is changing sometimes by the hour. So please bear with me. Um, at the state level in March, legislators authorized up to $1 billion of state funding to respond to COVID-19. Um, recently, as you know, the city of San Jose received an allocation of 3.9 million for state funding for emergency homeless solutions relative to the COVID-19 response. The state also set aside roughly 50 million into the iBank program for businesses that don't qualify for some of the federal small business association administration assistance programs. Um, the state also authorized an additional $1.3 billion from the Special Fund for Economic Uncertainties for COVID-19 related efforts. And the governor has said that he expects FEMA to reimburse for a lot of the expenditures. On the federal side, there have been three major packages to date. The first package, the Supplemental Appropriations Package, um, mainly contained funding to health and human services for response efforts like testing, PPE purchases, and vaccine development. There was also some limited funding for SBA loans as part of that first package. The highlight of the second package, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, was really uh, requiring paid sick leave and expanded family medical leave for companies with 500 employees or fewer and for local governments. Um, the bill included payroll tax credits for businesses to offset those costs, but it's important to note that those tax credits do not apply for local governments. Uh, and then the third package that recently came out was the CARES Act, which is a $2.2 trillion package. This is a very large package. Um, I included this slide to just show you some of the different areas that were funded through this package. And recently, uh, we just released an informational memo as well that goes into more detail on some of these sources. But for today, we really wanted to focus on two areas. One is uh, the pieces of the CARES Act that are coming to the city of San Jose. And then two, the pieces of the CARES Act that we think will really help some of the community members in San Jose as well. So for the city of San Jose highlights, uh, this bill actually includes a lot of funding sources that will go directly to the city. The major one is the Coronavirus Relief Fund. So this was $150 billion that will go to all states and to cities with the populations more than 500,000. Um, we expect the Treasury Department to release guidance on this program next week, including how much each jurisdiction will receive. 
there has been some um, controversy over what kind of census numbers to use for this particular fund and the calculations. So we're waiting for more guidance from the Treasury Department. Um, the FAA also received $10 billion for airports throughout the nation, and we anticipate that San Jose Airport will also receive some of those funds. Um, the CARES Act also included an additional $45 billion to FEMA for state and local response efforts. The amount of money that we will receive in San Jose will depend on the reimbursement um, process that we will go through with FEMA. A huge part of the CARES Act was also additional funding to housing and homelessness. You see on the screen, there was more money to the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG, uh, to the Emergency Solutions Grant, ESG, and then Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS or HOPWA. And we have uh, listed on the slide the first tranche of money that is coming from the CDBG and ESG funds to the City of San Jose. Uh, both of these programs have additional funding formulas uh, that will take into account how hard a community is hit by COVID-19, the housing market, et cetera. And we're waiting for guidance on HUD on what that formula will be. So we expect to have additional money come through those two programs. Uh, th through the Department of Justice, there was also $850 million to the Burn Justice Assistance Grants, and the City of San Jose will also receive a portion of that. And then finally, I wanted to mention that a big part of this package was a $425 billion economic stabilization loan that uh, corporations as well as local governments are eligible to apply for. And again, we're waiting for more guidance from the government about what the rules are to access that funding. Moving on to San Jose community highlights. Um, there were a lot of things that were in the CARES Act that will go directly to benefit the residents of, in San Jose. I think the biggest one is the direct assistance to individuals and to families uh, through the bill. This is subject to income limits, but the idea is that people would get a direct check from the federal government. Um, the CARES Act also greatly expanded unemployment insurance. It expanded to the, the types of people who are covered, including gig workers and those who are self-employed. And it also provided longer unemployment insurance benefits and additional money. Um, the Small Business Assistance Program also got a new program that I know Council has talked about in the past, the Paycheck Protection Program. These are zero fee loans to um, employers who uh, are able to retain their employees. There are certain rules around that. Um, I know the city also cares very much about food assistance and the CARES Act included $15.5 billion additional funding for SNAP, as well as $450 million for the Emergency Food Assistance Program. And in our county, a second harvest food bank should be receiving those funds from the CARES Act. And then finally, I wanted to mention very quickly, the CARES Act also included $3.5 billion for child care fund funds especially for child care for first responders and healthcare workers. These funds will be going to the California Department of Education and we're working with the state to figure out how they will be utilizing those funds. Finally, we wanted to end with a look forward. So at the federal level, things are moving fairly quickly. Um, there's news, again, by the hour about what the federal government wants to do. A lot of conversation about a fourth package uh, we hear that it will most likely be a CARES Act Part 2, um, that there's a lot of desire to augment some of these programs, like the Paycheck Protection Program, where you're hearing there's a lot of oversubscription, a lot of demand for very limited funding. Um, House Democrats have also talked about um, doing a, another package, and there were some initial reports that Infrastructure proposals might be a part of that package, but we're hearing that's a little bit less likely right now. Um, on the Senate side, the Senate Dems have also talked about um, doing raises to frontline workers, including healthcare professionals and first responders. Um, so we expect there to be more discussion this week and potentially some more action on the federal side. At the state level, the governor has asked state departments to look at cost-cutting measures for non-COVID-19 response. 
I think like us, they are looking at decreases in revenue and are trying to respond to that. Assemblymember Ting, who heads the budget committee in Sacramento, has also indicated to his colleagues that any new state spending is unlikely unless it focuses on either COVID-19 response, wildfire prevention, or homelessness funding. Um, the plan at the state level is for the legislature to adopt what they're calling a workload or baseline budget by June 15th, which is a statutory deadline for um, a budget at the state level. And then to have an August revision of the budget after the personal income tax deadline of July 15th, since they pushed that back. So the city's goal here is really to aggressively pursue funding through two revenue, two avenues. One is for the programs that are already law, there are opportunities that we have now to advocate for more flexibility in the funding and for that funding to come to the city of San Jose that we're looking at. And then two, of course, is to advocate for additional future funding sources to address some of the on the ground needs that we see in the city of San Jose. So with that, that's the end of my report. Okay, and I think Rosario is next. Yes, let me just get my screen up. Just let me know. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yes, we can. All right, great. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. I'm Rosario Miavis. I'm the Director of Communications. And in this activation, I am the Emergency Public Information Officer. And I'm happy to just uh, provide you with an update on what we've been doing to reach all of the communities that we serve here in San Jose. And for those members of the public, you can follow our presentation with this hashtag, Stay Healthy SD. In looking at the crisis that we're facing with COVID-19, um, you know, there, it's, it's a big communications assignment that's been ahead of us. And we've been activated in the EOC for, for five weeks. Um, and one of the first teams that was activated was the emergency public information officer and, um, and branch, the whole EPS branch. Um, I will share with you that these were probably not the communication objectives that we um, first set out on, but as we've evolved um, within the activation, the assignment has grown uh, more significant and more critical in scale. Um, so in looking at how we're approaching everything that is ahead of us and everything that we've already achieved, there's been these three key areas that I've been focused on as I'm leading the, the city's communication strategies. The first one is around public health education. Now, I would say that when we, uh, when we first started out in our activation, this was um, not as much of a focus for the city of San Jose. Um, it was, we were more at that time relying on the County of Santa Clara um, and the CDC to provide us with uh, messaging. And, um, and through, as that has evolved, um, not only our organization, but other organizations across the world have um, taken on their own public health efforts to not only amplify what our public health partners are doing, but also to localize those messages for our city communities. Um, so we're currently developing a public health messaging campaign. We do anticipate that it will be effective. We've already started that messaging, but I'll share more with you all about the creative concepts that you're going to see later on this week. The second objective for us has been uh, just communicating the Emergency Operations Center's continuity of operations roadmap. So earlier in this presentation, Kip shared with you all um, a glimpse of the roadmap and how we're tracking against it. Um, but as far as what we've been focused on for communications, it is our role to inform the public about how a city our size is continuing to manage services and operations um, given um, what we're facing with uh, COVID. Um, not only is that important for our communities and our businesses and the visitors that we serve um, here at the city, but it's also important for our workforce to have a solid understanding of um, how the city is managing uh, through this crisis. The third objective area has been employee engagement and keeping the workforce informed and engaged. And I would say that this has been one of um, our more significant communication challenges, specifically in this activation, primarily because of the length of the activation and also because of the, the challenges that it's presenting in the way that we work. Because much of our workforce is telecommuting, um, we have to be sheltering in place. 
um, that presents a communications challenge in the way that we would normally disseminate messages to employees. Um, that is, uh, we're operating in a very different environment um, this time around. We also have the workforce um, that is focused on core operations and keeping core city services running, and then those who are um, not focused on those core city services. Um, both of them are in, in kind of different assignments at this time, and we, we want to make sure that we're communicating and updating the entire workforce um, about what is, um, how we're managing through the operation, um, and then what is also expected to come. So this is the way that I've been looking at our communications objectives. Um, you know, as, as the communications leader for the city, there, there are many different audiences that um, I think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but also specifically um, in this, this crisis, I'm thinking about how we can take a mass communications approach to, meet, to reach many different audiences. And when we're communicating on a mass, uh, mass scale like this, um, you know, it, it's not helpful for us to just think about the public in terms of just the general broad public, but, but to look at our audiences by segment. And so what you're looking at is a diagram of our internal audiences and our external. And so, of, of course, um, you all are part of our um, key internal audiences, as well as our, as well as our employees, our um, council appointees, um, and also the workforce um, broken down into our senior staff, which are those department heads, and then executive staff, which is um, deputy directors, assistant directors, um, and directors. We also wanna keep all of our boards and commission members engaged because as the boards and commissions are on pause, um, they're still part of um, city representatives and we want to ensure that they're also informed as well. The external audiences is, is, is one of our most significant challenges um, in making sure that we're reaching all parts of our community and in languages um, that they are accustomed to and, and, and want to receive information um, about. And so I'll just start at the top. So our business community, um, small and large, our, our development community, um, those are parts of the community that Liaison Branch is focused on. And, and I know that Kim has um, shared updates with you all. And, and we also heard um, uh, previous updates to, them, to uh, City Council. Um, our visitors, so uh, Team San Jose, we are, we are actively partnering with them and also our airport um, to make sure that those visitors who are coming um, in and out of San Jose are also well informed. Immigrant community is also a key population for us because we know that um, in some circumstances, um, they may not have access to the same services um, that residents do. And so we want to ensure that they're still aware of the resources that are available to them and that um, they are also informed um, as well. High risk groups, uh, we, are, we are certainly focused on those who are most at risk for being impacted by COVID and we understand that they have uh, special communications that need to reach that audience too. Local, state, and federal government officials, uh, Ben just provided you with an update on what we're doing on the intergovernmental relations front. And so um, we are taking a, a mass communications approach um, in this overall communication strategy, but you can see that um, teams like Ben and the Intergovernmental Relations Team, Kim Wallace and the Liaison Branch, they are uh, focused on um, more um, segmented and targeted outreach to those groups. High risk spreaders are also a focus for us because um, they're, I, I think, uh, there has been some belief among the communities um, that are, are facing this, um, this disease that there are certain individuals who are not at risk and we do want them to know that they can be the risk by um, not sheltering in place. And so those are groups that we want to reach as well. Obviously the homeless community has been a focus for us as well as other vulnerable populations. And then Michelle just provided an update on um, nonprofit outreach too. And then our media partners. Our media partners have been um, wonderful in helping us get the word out and, and spread the stay at home message, um, as well as um, some key community influencers that I'll talk to in a moment. So in crisis communications, there, um, there are often challenges and there, there, are, uh, there tend to be three challenges uh, that any crisis communications practitioner would face, uh, but that, have, that we are certainly facing here. So uh, you know, these, are, these are some of the three top challenges for us. Um, number one is just information not being available. So, as the city of San Jose government, we want to ensure that our community is well informed, that we're closing any communication or information gaps and filling in that information with credible, reliable information. 
The EPIO team is a, um, a team of 50 communications professionals, and we're focused on um, specific areas, including internal communications, which, which I just talked about, um, but also content development, language access, social media, media relations, the website. So we have, uh, we have gathered a, a very strong and um, robust team to be able to address any of those information gaps so that our residents are not feeling like they're not receiving information or not informed, but they know exactly where to turn for credible, reliable information. Information sometimes not being credible. Um, I think what we're seeing with this particular pandemic is messaging confusion. And we've seen that in other countries, and we certainly have seen it here in the US. And we have um, partnered um, very well with the County of Santa Clara and with other public agencies to ensure that the, there's alignment on our messaging. Um, and also, um, I'll talk to you about some of the solutions that we've come up with to alleviate any messaging confusion that may um, have existed here so that we could get in front of it. Um, residents oft, also often will feel like there's a clutter of environments um, of information and we wanted to ensure um, going into this pandemic that they would not be feeling that way. So we'll talk to you about some of the solutions for that. And then the third challenge tends to be that information just doesn't reach everyone. Um, so um, it's important for us to be taking a multi-channel approach rather than a, a single or one-way approach um, in this pandemic. And, um, and we have certainly done that. So I would say that you know one of the, the most important aspects of any type of behavior change program um, is ensuring that people believe the message. Um, and the model that I use in behavior change is um, beliefs drive attitudes and attitudes drive behaviors and actions. And so that's been one of the, the um, key tenets that I've, I've thought about in um, how we're approaching managing through this crisis. Um, and we will continue to do that. And I'll talk to you about how we've been effective in um, driving belief um, in the stay at home message um, to enforce the, the county shelter in place order. So our first strategy in addressing some of these challenges and reaching these audiences that I just described um, is to create a localized public health campaign for our city of San Jose community. Um, we also want to, or have wanted and have been very effective, I believe, at um, urging res residents to follow the state of California and the County of Santa Clara shelter in place orders. Um, so the way that we've done that in the Emergency Operations Center is the city has formed a compliance unit um, that's currently being led by Erica Garofalo, and we have developed an evidence-based public health messaging campaign um, in partnership with uh, behavioral insights consultants, um, and we are um, we're very happy to share that. That campaign will be, um, it's been tested and it will be ready to launch um, at the end of this week. We, we plan to provide um, you all uh, with uh, toolkits, communication toolkits that you can share um, with a broader uh, community and your constituents. We'll also be promoting this information um, on, on our social media and I'll give you a glimpse of that campaign in a moment. Um, we also have launched a series of public health influencer videos um, that I hope you all have seen if you follow us on Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram. Um, we've been uh, highlighting some key celebrity um, community influencers and um, have been really happy to share information in different languages um, and have been very pleased to see the community um, be so active and enthusiastic about helping us spread the word and the stay at home message. So we will be, um, we have developed the campaign and we will be executing the campaign um, later this week. And so here's a, a glimpse, if you haven't, or if you don't follow us on social media, um, here's some of the influencer videos that we've already launched. Um, we've had um, uh, Hernan Hernandez and Jorge Hernandez from Los Tigres del Norte. Um, they were our, our first um, influencers. We also featured a video from city manager Dave Sykes, which is, is not shown here, but um, you can see his messages there as well. Um, we also have um, partnered with the San Jose Sharks and they shared a couple of videos and we were really honored to have participation from the San Jose Sharks and appreciate the partnership, um, as well as uh, members of our Vietnamese community who participated and shared videos too. And so the one that you're seeing there is um, Jenny Doe. Um, so this influencer video campaign has been very successful. Um, we've had a lot of uh, good interest in it. We actually have already seen um, 47,000 total views 
um, to our, our uh, social media channels. Um, and you're going to see more. And so this is just a sampling. Um, the team is hard at work at um, rolling out one to two videos a day. And so um, we just want to say thank you to everybody in the community that has been helpful at, um, at helping us uh, conduct this successful campaign. And so this, this approach that we're taking with these influencer videos that speaks to what I shared earlier about those key tenets in behavior change. What's important is not that just that people um, are aware or have heard about the stay at home message and the shelter in place order, but that they believe it and that they, they actually um, comply with it. And, and the way that we've um, taken a fun approach to ensuring compliance is by partnering with these community influencers who are already trusted, reliable sources of information in these different communities um, to spread those messages. And when our residents are receiving these, um, these information and these messages from these members of the community that they trust, they're more likely to adapt and believe the message and actually enact change, which is what we're seeing. And I, I believe that's one of the reasons why we've been so successful in our community. The second approach is this um, public health messaging campaign. So this is a sneak preview of what you all will see um, later this week. Um, we are going to be replacing these images that you see with actual authentic imagery of, um, of San Jose residents. And so this current image is a placeholder. Um, but the work that Behavioral Insights um, has done is they have tested five different strategies, uh, five different behavioral strategies, I should say, and determined which would be most effective with our community. Um, and so that, has, that messaging has been tested um, not only on a national level, but also um, with uh, local, um, we've also conducted local community outreach um, to see which messages resonate with, with um, different audiences. And I'd be happy to provide a more comprehensive update to the council about that messaging campaign that will launch uh, later this week. So our second strategy has been to communicate um, with our publics and, and help them follow along with what we're doing in terms of continuity of operations. Um, we do have the roadmap. We want the community to know that we have a plan and we want them to understand that plan, um, internal and external um, communities. And so the approaches that we've taken there is by providing regular, reliable, and timely updates, um, which we did from the beginning of our first activation. So you all are probably familiar with the flash reports right now. By now, we're actually on flash report number 46, I believe. And um, that, that has been a very effective mechanism for sending out information to all parts of our community um, and them grabbing that information and then posting that and disseminating it further to their individual publics. I will uh, just let you all know in, in case um, if everyone's not aware, um, the flash reports are a, the mechanism that the city uses in any emergency activation. So anytime we're activated in the EOC, the flash report is the official communications channel for updates from the EOC. And the approach that we took here was to provide twice daily updates um, so that the community would know that we are committed to transparency. It's helping to establish our information as credible. And it's also just a trusted source of, of news and um, information for the media and for any other of our publics and our segments of our community that are interested in information um, from the city. And it has been highly effective as well. We, um, we are averaging a 66% higher, um, uh, or 66 average open rate um, that is higher than the government's um, average. Um, actually, like, let, me, uh, let me correct uh, right there. It's, we have a 46% average open rate, and that is 66% higher than the normal governmental average. So we also have seen more subscribers to the flash report. We're averaging 100 new subscribers per every flash report dissemination. And since we've been activated, we've already seen more than 4,500 new subscribers to our e-notification list. So it's been highly effective in getting the word out. I will share that we, what you'll see next is video flash reports that are going to be um, highlighted on our social media and also available on our YouTube channel in Spanish, Vietnamese, and Mandarin. And so our language access team in the EOC is currently working on that. And as soon as we have those, we'll be sharing those um, with you as well. Um, we're also creating a dedicated web page 
for each one of those languages so that the flash report information is accessible. And the intent here is that we will bring the flash report information to life in those languages with a, a quick synopsis so that those members of the community who speak those languages and prefer to receive information updates in their language will be able to get that and access it very easily. We've also created a internal communications class report for employees. And so um, that is being disseminated on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 3 p.m. And we're looking at um, also providing webinar updates to employees going forward. And so our last strategy is um, how as a city are we mobilizing people to help? And so I will share that in the emergency public information team, we are less focused on this, um, on the day-to-day -day operations. I know that the Silicon Valley Strong campaign is primarily being led by um, the mayor's office, as well as the liaison branch and all the great work that they're doing with the local assistance center. Um, but our team uh, created some ideas that we'd like to share with you all if you are interested in, in taking these ideas. Um, and some of them um, is to produce a video of the council members highlighting ways that the communities can support. And the EPIO branch is happy to produce that video for you all and work with you all so that we can um, highlight that. Um, that information and um, highlight that Silicon Valley strong message. Um, we also um, brainstormed as a team that we could educate neighborhood groups and associations of ways to help and we're happy to help with that effort as well as developing a social media campaign for volunteers. Um, so those are just a few of the, the ways that um, you can support the Silicon Valley strong um, campaign and of course we're um, also highlighting that information in our flash reports um, with each edition. So that is, that's my update. Um, and now I will turn it back over to city manager, Dave Sykes. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Rosario. And just wanted to thank the whole team. Um, just want to kind of end where, where I started. Um, so about five weeks ago, we, we declared a local emergency. Uh, over three weeks ago, the county issued the shelter in place order that order has now been extended to may 3rd that's another four weeks um so we're not even in essence halfway through uh the shelter in place order um even though it seems like we've been in it forever um so we really value this opportunity to bring these updates to you and get your input um as i'm alluding to we've got uh plenty ahead of us to do and so opportunities for making improvements and making sure our community is served properly. So I think I'll end there and, and we're all available for questions.